This lecture is going to cover superposition and standing waves. Just to kind of recap what we have learned so far, we know the basics of waves and simple harmonic motion thanks to Abby, Mateo, and Alex, as well as some of the review from last year. We've covered intensity as well as polarization. And last class, we talked about reflection, refraction, and transmission. So today our focus again is gonna be superposition and standing waves. So just to follow along with our objective sheet, you can see that we're coming along quite nicely with lots of check marks. And today our focus is really going to be on sketching and interpreting superposition of pulses and waves, calculating a resultant of two waves, graphically and algebraically, as well as almost all of objective five so talking about standing waves versus traveling waves. Sketching and interpreting standing wave patterns in strings and pipes. We'll talk about boundary conditions on strings and boundary conditions on pipes. And then solving problems involving frequency, harmonics, length, and speed. Also keeping track of our equations in our data booklet, you can see that we have learned most equations in topic four um, we've covered 4.1, 4.2, 4.3. We're over here in 4.4. Today we're going to focus on constructive and destructive interference, and that's building to our last equation right here, which we'll get to in a few classes. Okay, let's dive in. So I want to begin by talking about how to create a wave pulse, let's say in a string, for example. So I want you to imagine a string and imagine kind of two scenarios. One of these is where your string has a free or a loose end, almost like it's attached to um, a ring and that ring is allowed to go up and down. We call this a free, loose, or soft end. And that's gonna be in contrast to a fixed or a hard end, which means like the string is actually attached to the wall or whatever it's on and it's not allowed to move up and down. So I'm gonna go head over to the simulation and we can take a look at those two scenarios. So on the top here, you have a hard boundary. On the bottom, you have a soft boundary. I want you just to take a minute to make some observations. Notice that this is indeed a wave pulse. It is not a continuous wave. It's as if I kind of moved my hand up and down to get a pulse on that string and retracing that pulse going there and then reflecting off of the boundary and coming back. So you should be noticing for a hard boundary, when it hits that boundary, it comes back inverted. So the hump on the top became a hump on the bottom. But on a soft or a free boundary, such as the bottom one here, it reflects back and it stays on that same um, topness. So you have a top bump going there and a top bump coming back. So I've recorded these observations in my notes. A free, loose, or soft boundary does not invert a pulse, but a fixed or hard boundary does invert. So with that in mind, I want you to try this practice problem. This is a multiple choice problem, A, B, C, or D. Pause the video here and lock in your answer. You should be able to rule out answers B and C. The way that I rule those out is by looking over here and seeing that we have a free boundary, that that ring is allowed to move up and down as the string would like. So I'm noticing this kind of weird bump outlined in black right here is on the bottom in B and in C, which is why I've eliminated those. I know for a free boundary, it will not invert. So B and C can't be true. So it comes down to A and D. What I would like you to look at here is the comparison between kind of our first bump, which I'm outlining in purple, and our second bump that I've outlined in black. Because my wave is given as moving to the right, this is the first thing that's going to be leading, followed by our second thing. And so when it hits the boundary and reflects back, now we're going from right to left, our first thing that we see should be the purple, and the second that we should see should be the black. 
That means that the correct answer here is indeed A. So I'd like to move on to something called superposition. Superposition is the algebraic sum of the displacement between two or more waves. Sorry about that. Superposition is a fancy way of saying you're going to add waves together. So when you have waves that are starting to interfere with each other, they're overlapping, you can add those waves together. Sometimes this means that you're adding negatives, so it kind of looks like subtracting, but overall, you can always add the two displacements, positive or negative. Now this could be like wave pulses overlapping, like we just talked about. This could be like full traveling waves that we're used to seeing. I've included a YouTube link here that'll go a little more into depth on superposition, but for now, I wanna present you with kind of the two scenarios. On the left, you have two wave pulses. You have A, which is in blue, and you have pulse B, which is in red, and they are heading towards each other. Now there's gonna be a moment where A and B completely overlap, and this is where we can use our superposition to add them together. Notice that A plus B adds to B a plus B. If we were given numbers, maybe this one has a peak um, value of two meters and this one has a peak value of two meters, this would now become four meters tall. And afterwards, as those waves keep moving, they kind of pass through each other and B continues to go on its way to the left, A continues to go on its way to the right. We would call this constructive interference, and we'll come back and define that in just a moment. Let's take a look, though, at destructive interference. Again, our story starts with a blue pulse, we're labeling that A, moving to the right, and a red pulse, labeling that B, moving to the left. But you'll notice here that B is down in the negatives. So when they interfere with each other, when they overlap, we would need to take A plus B, but B is in the negatives, and they exactly cancel out to be nothing. Numerically, it's as if you took two meters and negative two meters, and you added them together. Well, adding a negative is really like subtracting, they completely cancel. So there's a moment in time when A and B overlap each other, where you get nothing on your string. But then after that overlap, B continues on its way and A continues on its way. So let's take a moment to compare constructive versus destructive interference. Put simply, constructive interference, when the waves undergo superposition, it adds to get bigger. Notice in the left example, two meters plus two meters got bigger to four meters. And for destructive interference, you're adding a negative, which is essentially subtracting, and it gets smaller. So this is a decrease in that amplitude. Let's take a closer look. On the top here, you see superposition of two opposite direction wave pulses. You can see as they overlap right about here, they constructively interfere with each other and become bigger. But I mentioned to you that this could happen with pulses, like what we've been looking at, or it could happen with full waves, which is what you see down here. The bottom wave, notice how it is moving relative to the top wave. And so there are times like right here where it's fully constructive or other times like here where it is fully destructive interference. Again, this is the same principle as superposition, just adding each of those points as they overlap. Another great simulation that I would recommend playing around with is this guy, superposition and interference. What I like is that in the kind of skinny black lines, you can see the original wave pulse even as they interfere. 
You can also at the bottom here change, for example, the amplitude. Let's take a look. This will still combine to be bigger, a constructive interference. And you can flip directions. For example, if we had a top and a bottom that were coming to each other. And so you can try lots of combinations with this. The two simulations I just showed you, the links are listed right here in my notes. So I have a few problems for you to try. I would like you to drop two waves that are phase shifted by one wavelength. And I want to know what happens when they interfere with each other. What does that superposition look like? Would it be constructive, destructive, somewhere in the middle? And then I want you to repeat that question for two lambda, lambda over two, and three lambda over two. See if you can draw these out and decide constructive or destructive. Okay, let's take a look at the answers here. My process was first to draw the red wave, and then on top of that, draw the blue wave, shifting that blue wave over by lambda, as the problem described. As I shifted that wave over, you can notice that the red and the blue wave started to overlap, meaning that to apply superposition, they would be adding at every point. And so you'd get a resultant wave that is outlined in black. Notice that this is constructive interference. Same as in number two, when you shift two lambda over, again, those waves perfectly overlap, so it's constructive interference. This is compared to number three and number four, where we got destructive interference. Again, I first drew my red wave, and then I came over and drew my blue wave half a lambda away. Notice how it's exactly off. And so at every point, the top and the bottom will cancel to be nothing. You get a resultant wave that is, well, a flat line outlined in black. And same with number four, when I've um, moved my blue wave over, my blue wave over a phase difference of three lambda over two, or one and a half wavelengths, I again get destructive interference. So you should start to be noticing some patterns. The constructive interference is always happening when the phase difference is some factor times lambda. And by n here, I mean n could be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So for example, if you phase shift something lambda, or 2 lambda, or 3 lambda, or 4 lambda, and so on, you'll get constructive interference. And you can see that in examples one and two. By contrast, you're getting destructive interference when you have a phase difference equal to n lambda over two, where n here is one, three, five, seven, meaning that lambda over two, or three lambda over two, or five lambda over two, and so on, will all give destructive interference. And we can see that in question three and question four. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about a very special case called standing waves. Now standing waves occur when two waves that are traveling at the same speed that have the same wavelength and equal or almost equal amplitudes. When these two waves are traveling towards each other in opposite directions, they are gonna superimpose and interfere, but in a really special way, okay? Now, where are these two waves coming from? Oftentimes, it is gonna be a wave that is going towards a boundary Bouncing off of that boundary, maybe inverting itself if it's a fixed boundary, or bouncing back just the same if it's a um, loose boundary. And then it's going to be reflected back the way it came. Okay. 
So you have a wave traveling towards the boundary and a wave traveling back from the boundary. And those two waves are gonna interfere as long as they're at the same speed, wavelength, ampl amplitude, and of course, opposite directions, they could interfere into what we call a standing wave. Let me show you what a standing wave looks like. To me, this is one of the coolest things. I'm gonna open up this simulation here. I would recommend that you open it up as well. Let me show you what it does. So in this simulation, you can either make it go in slow motion, which is absurdly slow, real time, or it can go in fast motion. So you can kind of see it a little bit better. Now you'll see in the background that there's a blue wave and an orange wave. And this represents the two waves that are interfering with each other. You could imagine that one of those waves was heading towards the right and then it hits a boundary. And then the other wave is that reflected um, wave coming back from the boundary. And you can see as I hit the next harmonics, you can start to see some patterns in standing waves. I'm gonna change this to fast motion, whoa. So what you start to see if you're not dizzy is you see these areas that are really, really big that like they're adding together. You see some a other areas where they're like canceling out the constructive or destructive interference. Let's take a look at one open end and one fixed end just to get a sense of what that looks like. Again, you see this kind of consistent constructive in the resultant wave. If I put this into fast motion, it almost looks like there's like a bulge here. And if you zoom in on this spot, it actually doesn't move at all. The interference is always destructive at that spot. I'll go to two open ends so you can see what that looks like. Again, we're getting these areas that are constructive, kind of like forming a bulge. And this point right here, totally destructive all of the time. Notice that this only happens at certain frequencies. So I'm using these kind of preset harmonics. We'll talk about, about what that means in a second. These preset harmonics are making it so that I have the exact frequency where I get a standing wave. But if I don't hit that frequency, then it's just kind of a hot mess and we don't get this nice constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive. To prove to you that this really does exist and happen in the real world, I wanna show you this video of a guitar string having a standing wave. <laughs> Let's take a look at that standing wave itself. Now notice in this picture, we're kind of showing the extremes of the standing wave. We're highlighting the areas that are constructive and destructive and constructive and destructive and so on. But I want to highlight that, yes, these are the extremes. The actual standing wave is the string is at this point in the standing wave. And then the string goes like this in the standing wave. And then the string goes like this in the standing wave. And so you can imagine the string is actually oscillating back and forth at each of these points, back and forth between these maximums, okay? So don't be confused. It is not that we have two strings. We're just showing kind of the upper end and lower end maximums. So you'll notice that there are these points, we refer to them as nodes. The nodes are where the amplitude is always zero. In this diagram, you can see that the nodes are gonna be here, 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 
and here. There are five nodes for the standing wave. Antinodes, on the other hand, are places where the interference is constantly changing from constructive to destructive. So for example, you could trace the particle. Sometimes it's here or here or here or here or here. If it were right here in the middle, you would get destructive interference. If it were up here, you would get total constructive interference. So in this diagram, we see one, two, three, four antinodes. Five nodes and four antinodes. Also looking at this diagram, I can tell you right away that we have a fixed end on the left and we have another fixed end at the right. After all, fixed ends don't allow those particles to move. The string cannot move up and down on that hard boundary. And so a fixed end has to be a node. It's not allowed to move up and down. The amplitude is zero. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into those boundary conditions, looking for some patterns. So first, let's talk about two closed or fixed ends. Here are some standing waves where both ends are fixed. Therefore, you see a node and a node at every one of these ends. You can see when you have a closed or a fixed end, you get nodes. Okay. Now I also want to point out that these, um, these standing waves are kind of getting more complex as we go on. These standing waves are going from the first harmonic to the second harmonic to the third harmonic and to the fourth harmonic. You can see those labels over here. It's important to note that a synonym for the first harmonic is also called the fundamental. I kind of think of the first harmonic as I draw in my nodes first, and then I try to fit one bump between them. Again, drawing just the maximums of the string, not two strings itself. And the second harmonic, I would fill in my nodes first, and then I would try to draw two bumps in between it. And so on with the third harmonic, always starting and ending on nodes because this is a fixed end and fixed end. And your fourth harmonic has kind of like four bumps. I do want to take a minute here and just outline wavelength. Now let's call this the length of your string, the length of your string or eventually even a tube. Now I'm noticing that I see a full wavelength in my second harmonic, that the wavelength here is equal to L. But in my third harmonic, the wavelength is going to be just a fraction of what I'm seeing. My wavelength is going to be equal to 2L over 3, or 2 thirds L. Here, my wavelength has decreased just a little bit more. My wavelength here is now simply half of L. I kind of skipped over the fundamental, but I'll come back to that. You could imagine extending this wave far out so that you could see both of the bumps, a full wavelength. Here, a full wavelength would be equal to two times the length of your string. A really great real world example of two fixed end is a guitar string that we just saw. Next up, let's consider a different boundary condition. A boundary condition where one end is going to be closed or fixed and the other end is going to be free or open. Notice that I'm introducing a tube here and I'm grouping together the fixed end of a string with a closed end of a tube. A tube kind of like a clarinet. The closed end being this end, the reed where you're blowing through. That's where the air is restricted. And I'm grouping together the open end of a tube 
with the free end of a string. That would be like this side of the clarinet that's nice and open. So a clarinet is a great example of this boundary condition where it's closed on one side and open on the other side. Following true to suit, just like before, when you have a fixed end, you get a node. When you have a free end, you get an anti-node. So let's take a look at the harmonics. Zooming in on the first harmonic or the fundamental, I'm going to put a node on my fixed end and an anti-node on my free end. And then I'm going to connect it with as few humps as possible. So here is my first harmonic. Jumping up to the next harmonic, again, I start with my node and my anti-nodes, but this time I'm going to introduce just one more bump in between the two. And so on for each of the harmonics here. Let's take a look at the wavelengths again. Let's call the length of my tube, or let's say clarinet, L. I want you to imagine extending this wave so far out that you can actually see an entire one. You'll notice that we would need to get lambda to be four times the length of the tube in order to see a full wavelength. Similarly here, I would need to extend out this much further to see my full wavelength. That means that a wavelength is going to be four thirds of my length of the tube. Consider this one right here. I can actually see my whole wavelength, here being one wavelength. So lambda here would be equal to four L over five or four fifths of the tube. Again, over here, I can see my lambda. Lambda here would be four-sevenths of the length. And you're starting to see a pattern arise. Something that you notice is kind of strange in the naming of the harmonics here is that it goes first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth. It skips over the second and fourth and sixth and all of the even number harmonics. My theory as to why that happens is expressed in the wavelength. You'll sometimes see IB questions that ask for like the um, second most harmonic of an open and fixed end. What they're actually talking about is the third harmonic because there is no second harmonic. The third harmonic is like the second in line. We have one more set of boundary conditions that would be open on both ends. Again, this could be open as in a tube on both sides, or it could be free as in a string on both sides. And this is going to follow the same convention for an open or a free end, you will get an anti-node. A great real, real world example is a flute. So as I draw these, I'm going to start by drawing in my anti-nodes on both ends. I know that those are open ends, so I must have an anti-node. And then I connect those for the first fundamental, or sorry, the first harmonic, the fundamental. I connect those with the least number possible. For the second one, I again start with the anti-nodes, and I add a hump. Same with the third and fourth harmonics. Notice that in comparison to our last example, these harmonics just go up normally. We can take a look at the wavelengths. Here we are seeing half a wavelength. So that means that we would need two lengths of the tube in, in order to see the full wavelength. In the second harmonic, we see an entire wavelength. So lambda is simply equal to the length of the tube. In the next one, we are seeing one and a half wavelengths, meaning that 
half of the two is going to be, sorry, the half of the length is going to be one lambda. And then the last one, we are seeing two full wavelengths. So one wavelength is going to be equal to one fourth of the two. Now, no matter what combination of boundary conditions you have, whether it's closed or fixed ends, whether it's closed on one end and open on the other, or whether it's both open or free. The important thing to remember here is that an open end or a loose end or a free end is always going to yield an anti-node. A closed end or a fixed end is always going to yield a node. And if you remember these two keys, you should be able to think through the rest. So with that in mind, I'm going to challenge you as a check-in to draw the first three harmonics for an open open, a closed open, and a closed closed. Here I've already drawn the tubes for you. Try to do this from memory. Do the best that you can. It takes a little practice. And then you can also predict the wavelength in terms of L, the length of the tube for each of those patterns. Pause the video now and try this. And take a moment to check over your answers. I wanted to share a few more examples with you. Um, these examples are going to have to do with longitudinal or sound waves forming standing waves as well. So the first example is going to be a Rubens tube. So what we have here is a length of PVC pipe, has about 100 or so holes drilled at half inch increments, got some foil tape to keep it from melting. On this side we've got a two inch speaker matching the diameter of this two inch tube. On that side we've got some lab tubing leading to some propane. So let's fire it up and see what it does. All right, as you can see, we got some nice standing planes, a little bit of oscillation from the vibrations in the hose. Let's throw some sound in there, see what happens. Let's start with a 449 hertz frequency. As you can see, this sets up a standing wave and we can see, well, the emerging sine curve that represents sound. What happens here is we're having the sound compressing here and not compressing here. The lower pressure here allows more gas to escape into the atmosphere, shaping the sound curve. Now, if we change the frequency, we can see each time we set up a standing wave, we get that sine curve. Higher the frequency, the more waves. Now let's throw some music at this. How about some Dave Brubeck? Now we have real life sound visualization. So here the sound waves are forming um, compressions and rarefactions as longitudinal waves do. But the sound wave that is going there versus the sound wave that's bouncing, bouncing back are interfering. And at certain frequencies, it's going to form a standing wave, which is where we got those kind of nice humps. This would be an area of constructive interference and an area of destructive interference, or an anti-node and a node. So I want to show you just one more video here. Um, this video is going to be kind of a combination of music and art and science, and it is definitely worth the watch. This is called a Kaladni plate that he has hooked up now.
for the sake of time, I do want to pause it there. If you would um, like to check out the rest of that video, it is linked in my notes. It is this guy right here, this Vimeo. Okay. So to conclude today, I just want to highlight a few important differences between traveling waves that we've been talking about quite a lot that are kind of moving along versus a standing wave where we're getting these patterns of nodes and anti-nodes from the reflective wave interference with the original wave interference. Traveling waves, they do transfer energy, whereas standing waves are not actually transferring energy. Traveling waves, each point is oscillating at the same amplitude. It might not be at the same position as the point next to it, but it will reach that maximum position just the same as all the other points. As opposed to a standing wave, wave where you have the anti-nodes and the nodes, for example, the anti-nodes, their maximum, their amplitude is always zero. Whereas the nodes have a, an amplitude that is something non-zero. So not all the points share an amplitude in standing waves. In traveling waves, all of those points might are not, definitely not in phases. But in standing waves, you must be in phase. That's the way of creating those nodes and anti-nodes. So with that in mind, let's take a moment to try a gear up problem. This gear up problem is about a pretty famous experiment that hopefully when we get back to campus, we can actually do ourselves. You have a tuning fork above this um, tube and this tube is lowered into water. Let's take a look at this experimental setup. Do play your note through your earphones. I'm playing around about 600 hertz at the moment. Hold the earphone over the top of the tube and then slowly pull it up and listen really carefully for when you hear a maximum in the intensity of the sound. So I estimate that that's my maximum. So at that point, I measure the length of the tube. So we're gonna pause there now that you have a feeling for the setup. Of course, this is a tuning fork instead of her um, headphone. And I'm gonna tell you that this tuning fork is uh, at a frequency of 256 Hertz. And we're varying the length L as shown here. I want to know at which heights is this tuning fork going to reach its maximums? And at which heights is this going to reach the minimum sound? You can assume that the speed of sound for this problem is 334 meters per second. So again, you're looking for the maximum volumes and the minimum volumes. Pause the video here, give this a try, and come back to check your answer. Okay, so first I wanna highlight the air column in which this sound wave is going to be vibrating. And I'm gonna draw that a little bigger over here. And notice I'm drawing a closed end on one end. That's because the water below it has created a seal so that the water has essentially sealed off that end of the tube. It's acting like a closed end. And of course it is an open end on the other side because the air is free to vibrate back and forth on that side. I'll draw in our first harmonic, also known as the fundamental, putting my anti-node on the free end and my node on the fixed end. In fact, I'm going to draw just a few more fundamentals, or sorry, a few more harmonics. The next harmonic is going to be something like this. And our third harmonic is going to be something like this. Okay. I'm also just going to outline with relation to the length, we're given this as L, that here we are seeing lambda would be four times the length of the tube. Or here, lambda would be four thirds the length of the tube. Here, lambda would be four fifths the length of the tube. We can see that lambda right here. 
Now, I know that standing waves are being created. And when those standing waves are being created, that's when we're getting that nice maximum. We're getting that real holistic sound. So the question is, at what frequencies are these maximums actually being created? Or rather, what wavelengths are they actually being created? I'm noticing that in my givens, I have a frequency and I have a velocity. So I'm gonna solve for the wavelength here. I'll use V equals F lambda, or rearrange, we can see lambda equals V over F. And solving for lambda, I get about 1.3 meters. Now, of course, I'm asked for the heights at which the tuning fork is gonna reach its maximum. So I need to figure out what that means for the length right here. So if my lambda is 1.3 meters, I'm gonna take a look at the first harmonic and use this equation to plug in my lambda in order to solve for the length. This first one comes out to be a length of 0 0.325 meters or 32.5 centimeters. So if I lower the tube such that there are 32.5 centimeters above the water, I should get a maximum. I can apply that to the next one here, lambda as 4 thirds L. And here, coming out with a length of 0 0.975 meters or 97.5 centimeters. I've repeated that same calculation for my last standing wave, my third harmonic, and I'm seeing that at any of these points, I would get standing waves. I would get that nice full maximum sound. This question also asks us to find the minimums though. We know the minimums are simply going to be in between these frequencies. So that turns out to be 65 centimeters and 130 centimeters. These would be our minimums. You'll often see IV questions asking about this setup. It's a very famous experiment. So this concludes the lecture. We have now sketched and interpreted superposition of waves. You could calculate the resultant of two waves by algebraically or graphically adding them. We also dealt with superposition in the form of standing waves with our boundary conditions and solving problems.